Good morning, church. Uh, I should be good on the wireless mic so I can move around a little bit. Um, how are you all doing this morning? Um, 2020 is a crazy year, isn't it? I feel like nothing has quite gone to plan this year. Um, fortunately, the good or the bad, God is still with us, and so we have his uh, companionship, and that makes the journey bearable. Uh, I'm saying thankful for that. Uh, let's bow our heads one more time, and then we'll get started in our message this morning. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you so much for bringing us here this morning. I'm glad that we can meet here to worship you, um, to be in your presence together as a, a collective family. Um, I ask that you help me this morning. I'm a little uh, drained, and just ask that you would give me strength, and please send your Holy Spirit to guide us Amen. this morning that you would be praised. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you look in your bulletins, you'll see that there is a description under the uh, order of uh, the service, a description of what today's sermon is supposed to be about. Um, there is a very deep, difficult, scientific or philosophical question that is there in three words. And the question is, what is life? So I'm actually going to give you all the opportunity to try to answer that question. If you could give a definition for life, what would your answer be? How do you define life? And it's open to be responded to. Is this an easy question or a difficult question? No answer. Oh, so is it moderate difficulty? Yes. Uh, so I would say pursuit of salvation. Okay, so life is the pursuit of salvation. So then a question for you, can plants... Can you put the mic? Oh, I should use the podium mic. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so the question is, what is life? Um, a, a definition that's been suggested is the pursuit of salvation. Now question, do plants pursue salvation? I would say no, but are plants alive? Yes. So just in terms of the actual, like, physical life, how do we define that? Yes, Kathy. Um, well, a state of existence. Okay, a state of existence. So what does it mean to exist? Okay, to be. So does this chair exist? Is it living? It's not. So, okay, so we need to keep working on this. Um, Anyone else? We'll take maybe one or two more. What does it mean? What does it mean for there to be life? Or what is life? Yes. Okay, the ability to reproduce or grow. The unfortunate difficulty with definitions for life is there are exceptions to the rule. Um, as I was reading, for example, a mule, for example. If I have the right animal, tends to not reproduce, but it's alive. So therefore, is that a full definition? Um, it's close, but not quite. Another definition I've read, and this gets more into scientific terminology, has to do with the idea of uh, metabolism, like turning energy around into life-sustaining force. Um, so as I was reading this week and kind of uh, seeing what was out there, I was reading a uh, Forbes article where somebody who tries to put scientific ideas and verbiage into common terminology um, was basically saying that this is a question that scientists and philosophers struggle with because they can come up with a list of criteria of what defines life, but there tends to always be an exception that either meets the criteria but is not alive or misses a criteria and is alive. Yes? I'll stay here. That's fine. Should I take this off then? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, podium mic it is for today. Um, in other words, there's no clear definition or what life actually is. We, we, can, we can know the signs of it, 
but to know what life is at its actual core is very difficult to, to put our finger on. Um, however, we kind of know it when we see it. So, like, we know what it is, but to actually clearly articulate what it is is very difficult. And so what that tells me is that life itself is very mysterious and very miraculous at the same time. Um, something that I can't explain, but is so incredible that it just boggles my mind that life exists. Um, so I'd like to open our uh, Bibles this morning and go to John chapter 1. And so the attempt of the message is not to define what life is, but to show that Jesus is the source of life. In him is the actual source of life, and it flows from him, and kind of the impact that that life has on us and what that means for us. So let's go to John chapter 1. And I'd like to start from the beginning of the book. So John chapter 1. And we'll read verses 1 through 4. So John chapter 1. We'll do uh, verses, sorry, I said 1 through 4. I mean 1 through 5. So verses 1 through 5. And um, this passage says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And I love these next four words. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. We continue reading on in this passage. We see that the word is a descriptive term for Jesus, who became one of us on this planet. But it says that in Jesus, and of course this applies to the Godhead as a whole, um, in Jesus is the source of life. Whatever it is, this incredible power flows from the being of Jesus. Um, it's so powerful that he can speak and things happen. Not only material comes out of nothing, but life comes out of nothing as well. It's just absolutely incredible. In Jesus is life. Um, I've read this uh, phrase before that in Jesus is life, original, unborrowed, underived. It's incredible. Um, and I, I, I'm fascinated by the way that life worked itself out in the miracles of Jesus. I'd like to show two examples. Uh, the first one is in Matthew chapter 8, um, verses 1 through 3. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. And this is the story of Jesus encountering uh, one of the lepers that he experienced or that he came across in his ministry. So Matthew chapter 8, uh, verses 1 through 3, says that when Jesus had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. Um, now, some of you may know how leprosy was viewed in the nation and in the culture of that time. Basically, if you had leprosy, get away. <laughs> you were to be banished from society at that point. Um, the technical term was that they were considered unclean, cer ceremoni ceremonially unclean. Um, they would be examined when they were determined that they had the disease of leprosy, um, which perhaps it's an umbrella term, but basically like skin and nerve disease. Um, one example is basically you don't feel your nerves anymore, so then you basically your body just gets harmed to the point that you die. Very ho horrific. Um, but there was such a fear of its uh, of it being contagious that they were just Vanished outside the city. You could not come in, you could not interact uh, with society anymore. Basically, it was like a living death sentence uh, for those people. Um, not only physically, but socially as well. You were cut off. Um, and if you happened to touch anyone that was unclean, you would be unclean yourself um, for at least seven days until the priests cleared you of the, the unclean status. 
So we can put our uh, imagination caps on. Um, Jesus is being followed by a crowd of people, and there is somebody who has leprosy that's standing in the way. And then, like the Red Sea, everybody just parts because they don't want to be anywhere near the man with leprosy. Um, so everyone parts and flees. And then just imagine the disciples, ah, leprosy, unclean, get away, get away, get away. And they start running. And then, Jesus, no, come. It's like Jesus is not running with everybody else. And is dignity and composure, Jesus is just standing there facing this person. Um, and instead of running, he approaches the person. Um, and what I find incredible is that when the man speaks with him, Jesus did the unthinkable. Um, as it says there in verse 3, Jesus actually put out his hand, and he did what? He touched him. Okay, so what does that mean for Jesus? Jesus is now unclean, right? He, so he's supposed to be unclean, but because he is the source of life, his life heals the person as opposed to the uncleanness coming to him. To me, that's incredible. Jesus, Jesus' life is contagious to whoever he touches, as opposed to the other way around. His life trumps the sickness of the other person. Um, and we can relate to that as well. Our, the life of Jesus always trumps the sicknesses of the human soul. Um, let's take a look at Luke chapter 7 as well. Um, so that was one example of sickness, um, but what about death? Uh, Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 12. Luke 7, 12 through 15. Um, Jesus happened to be traveling. Um, I think he was approaching a city called Nain. So verse 12, it says, And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. You can imagine a widow. She has no way to provide for herself. Her son was uh, supporting her, and now he was dead, so she had nothing left. Um, and a large crowd from the city was with her. And then it says, Then the Lord saw her, and he had compassion on her, and said, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him to his mother. Then great fear came upon all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God had, has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. So just as the life of Jesus was contagious in the example of the leper, the life in Jesus is just as powerful to spark life in somebody who's died. Um, Jesus, off the top of my head, I think he healed three people in his ministry. There is this person here. Um, there was the daughter that's healed in the very next chapter, and then also Lazarus was healed. And he had been dead four days, so he began to already decompose. Um, but the power of life that's in the word of Jesus, even if he just speaks it, automatically causes it to happen, to life to regenerate and to come back to what it was intended to be. So in Jesus is life, and it's powerful. And if we're connected to Jesus, then our life, uh, will be strong and uh, amazing. Okay, so in Jesus is life. Now, what does this mean for mankind, the human family? Uh, let's turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And this is where I begin to see the miracle of life on a, a little bit more personal level. Um, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. This is a detailed account of the creation of Adam. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And if we stop there, has man been created? Yes. But is man alive? No. 
It's a, a, a dead body there. But it continues, it says, And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So whatever this spark or this breath is, it turned the dead body into a live one. Um, to me, this is, this is a miracle. There's no other way to explain it, that even life itself is a gift that God gives, and it's miraculous. Because um, life itself can be described but not explained. Um, and when it comes to science, to me, this is evidence for the creation account. Because life is so incredible, I can't imagine how it can just appear out of nothing in a random process. Um, even mankind in their laboratories have not gotten to the point where on their own they can create life. It's miraculous. It's, it's incredible. And so in this moment, the form of a body becomes alive. And we have the mankind, we have the human family. Um, just as incredible to me and mind-boggling is when something that was alive becomes dead. How is it that something that was, there's no spark anymore? To me, that disappearance of that spark is mind-boggling. I don't really comprehend it. Um, we weren't designed for it, so it's, it messes with our minds. Um, but God created mankind with the plan for them to live forever. It wasn't meant to be temporary like we experience today. It was meant to be forever. Uh, mankind would be in perfect health. They would experience loving relationships. There would be peace and harmony. Um, we would have freedom. We would experience pleasure. Um, the Garden of Eden, that word Eden means pleasure. God wanted them to experience life at its fullest. Um, work would be always productive. Uh, we would be happy, and we would have face-to-face -face communion with God. That was the original plan. But unfortunately, because of sin, that plan was uh, broken, and that's not the experience that we have today. I don't know if uh, any of you have necessarily thought along these lines, but in Jesus is life, and that life, because it's the source of life, it will last for all eternity. But life on this planet, if left to itself, life eventually runs out. It may be quick, it may be long, but life separated from the source eventually runs its course. And that's what distinguishes us as the creation from Jesus as the creator. That life is a gift that's given, but is not inherent into, into our lives. For example, the Bible says that God alone has immortality, um, but if left to our own, we will all die. Um, so just thinking about the subjects of life and death to me is such a fascinating um, topic. Fortunately, even though sin came into the world, Jesus still wants to give us life. He came into the world to give us life. Now, so let's go to John chapter 3 and look at the familiar text. John chapter 3 and verse 16. As we get later into the sermon, I'll revisit these topics a little bit and kind of go into them a little bit deeper. But for now, just kind of setting the overview of life itself and that life is in Jesus. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus wants us to have life, and not just life in the temporary sense. He wants us to have life in the permanent sense that he originally designed and intended us to have. Eternal life, this life that will never go out, never run its course. Um, by faith in him and repentance, we are connected to Jesus in a way that will last for eternity. It's, it's life on another level. Um, I don't know what it says in the bulletins there for this description, but basically when we're connected to Jesus, life is on a whole new level. Eternal life will last forever. And it's not only the duration of time, but it's the quality of life as well. The quality of life 
goes up when we are tapped into the source of life that is in Jesus. And not only does it elevate our life in the future when it comes to eternal life and heaven and the new earth, but the Bible actually teaches that life, eternal life, can begin in the moment. Um, but since we're in the book of John, let's go forward to chapter 4. And Jesus here is encountering a woman um, who is uh, very much ashamed of her life and is kind of distancing herself from the society and the town that she's in. Um, but Jesus asks her, she's a Samaritan woman, but Jesus asked her for a drink and engages in this conversation with her. And he uses the illustration of the water to communicate this truth of eternal life to her. And says, you know, if you keep drinking of this water, you're going to get thirsty. You have to revisit it. Um, but if you drink, and let's read the text I'm going to read, because otherwise I'm just going to describe it. <laughs> uh, John 4, starting verse 13, it says, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus is using the illustration of the water to communicate that when Jesus is accepted into our lives, that it becomes the source of life that springs into eternal life. So eternal life is not just a future concept, but that quality of life, that never-ending, miraculous, true life can begin in the here and now where not only does the future life improve, but the current life improves as well. We're connected with Jesus, the source of life. And so in this life, we have a healing of the soul that leads us to glorification and immortality in the future. It's so incredible. Jesus is the source of life, and by connected to him, we have not only a better future, but a better now as well. And so... In summary, so far, Jesus is the source of life, this powerful, incredible, mysterious, but miraculous life is in Jesus. And when we're connected to him, we also have life, not only not just the temporary life that we experience now, but the eternal life, the rich quality of life that will extend through all eternity. So what can we draw from this? Four points I'd like to share with you that we can draw from this discussion on life and life being in Jesus. Point number one, come to Christ. Connect yourself with him. Let's go to the scripture reading, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, uh, verse, uh, yes, verses 11 through 13. So 1 John chapter 5. Verses 11 through 13. And again, this verse also shows that eternal life begins in the moment. It says, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this echoes what we read in John chapter 1. It says, and this life is in his son. In Jesus is that source of eternal life. That's where it springs forward. Verse 12, it says, he who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Where is life found? Eternal life? It's in Jesus. So connect yourself to Jesus. Place your faith in him. Repent of your sins. Abide in him. Live with him day by day. And as it says in verse 13, you can know that you have eternal life. We can have assurance of our salvation in Jesus. If we're connected to him, it says we have eternal life. All that matters is that we have the Son. If we have the Son, we have life. Point number one, come to Christ and stay connected to him. Point number two, uh, we should seek help as needed to overcome and receive healing 
for the physical or mental or emotional struggles that we have in this life. I'd like you to turn with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and verse 10. And this again builds on the point that Jesus wants us to have life, not only in the future, but in the here and now. So John chapter 10 verse 10, it says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. He's describing the work of really Satan in, in that passage. But he changes it. He says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Uh, my roommate looked this up in the original language, and it's uh, it's more more abundant. Like it's as exaggerated, like as abundant as you can imagine. That's the type of life that Jesus wants you to have. Um, you think Jesus is just talking about the future, or is he talking about the present life as well? It's both. God wants our life to be abundantly rich here as well as in the future because eternal life begins now in the moment. First of all, when it comes to the broken condition of humanity that we're in, none of us none of us are 100% whole. That's just the reality of the world that we live in. We've all been in, in, impacted by sin. And so we have struggles in this life that we deal with, both externally and internally that we deal with. Um, so how do we receive healing? How do we have an abundant life? The first step, come to Christ. Jesus is the source. So if we're connected with him, at a minimum, we have eternal life. There are some struggles that we have in life that God will miraculously deliver us from in a moment. Um, some of us have experienced, or maybe you know of people here in the church family that have had alcohol habits or smoking habits, for example, that when they came to Christ, cravings went away. Their life was miraculously changed in a moment. Just as much as Jesus touching somebody and healing him, healing them when he was doing his ministry here on planet Earth. Sometimes healing takes time. Sometimes there's things, desires, situations that we struggle with over a period of time. That's not to say that you are failing in that struggle. That's not what that means. But some struggles are delivered in a moment, and some are ones that we wrestle with for a lifetime. So don't be discouraged if you feel like your life is in a tug of war and that there's a struggle going on. Because we can still be surrendered to Jesus in that struggle. The struggle does not mean we can be we have to be disconnected from Jesus, the source of life. Um, but because sometimes there's an ongoing struggle, um, it helps after we've come to Christ to seek help from the community around us, whether it's the support of family and friends, whether it's professional help in medical areas or counseling areas or whatever it may be. Don't be ashamed to seek help if you need help. Because in the end, God wants us to have an abundant life, and we should be willing to use the resources at hand to have an abundant life. Um, uh, sometimes just pray more is not enough. It's necessary, but sometimes it's not the only thing to be able to best handle the struggles that we're in. So point number one Come to Christ, stay connected to the source of eternal life. And number two, seek help as needed to overcome the physical and emotional and the mental struggles that we have in this life. There's no shame in this because in Jesus is life and joy at its fullest. Point number three, let's go to John chapter 11. And the point is this, when we understand as best as we can, the nature of life. There's no need to fear death. Uh, John chapter 11 tells the story of a Jesus encountering, uh, not encountering is not the right word, Jesus coming to resurrect Lazarus. 
and he had intentionally waited so that the glory of God would be best revealed in the delay of this miracle. Um, but when he arrived, Lazarus still had two sisters that wanted to know why. Why did you wait? Um, in death, sometimes there's questions that we don't have answers to, and that's okay. Um, the why will not always be explained. In John chapter 11, first it's Martha that comes to speak to Jesus. And this is uh, the part I'd like to read. Um, starting in verse, uh, it would help if I'm in John 11, I'm in John 10. So that's not what that passage is about. Okay, John 11, <laughs> starting in verse um, 21. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But she still had faith. She said, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Incredible. Jesus, as it says in the book of Revelation, he has the keys to the grave and to death. He can unlock that at any moment. How many of you say amen that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? He is the life. In him is life. And so... Jesus here, he kind of, he, he, he mentions a couple phrases that are almost contradictory. First he says, though he may die, he shall live. And then he follows up and he says, he who lives and believes in me shall never die. So if we are in Christ, do we die? In a way, yes, but in a way, no. The way is this. There is a first death that all of us, unless Jesus comes, our life will run its course and we will die. However, there is a second death. And Jesus has promised that those who believe in him will be resurrected and we will experience the glories of eternal life. And so, as we've discussed, when we believe in Jesus, the eternal life begins in that moment. And... The first death is not a real death. Jesus and the whole Bible has described this, Old Testament and New Testament, as a sleep. It's temporary. It's just for a moment. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die because eternal life never dies. We may have sleep for a moment, but in the eternity future, we will have eternal life. So, therefore, the first statement of Jesus is true. Though he may die, he shall live. Incredible promise. Um, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul describes the resurrection and what it will be like. And he gives encouragement to the believers who, I guess, were under the impression that if you died before Jesus came, that was it. Like, you needed to stay alive until he came because if you died, that would be permanent. And so he wrote those words to say, I don't want you to sorrow as those who have no hope. What I gather from that is that in death, even for the believer, there is sorrow. But it's a sorrow mixed with hope because we have the faith in the future resurrection. Grief is a very real experience for the human family, believer or not. Um, I lost my train of thought, but this is where it becomes personal this week. Um, some of you may know um, Mike Grant, who has come to Tempe in the past, and also his sisters have come here in the past as well. Um, this week his wife was to give birth to twin children, um, but they were stillborn this week. And so his children uh, passed away. And then a friend of ours from Glendale Church, uh, Thursday morning he went 
scouting at the uh, White Tank Mountains west of town. He went hiking by himself and I guess had an accident, but we searched for him yesterday and found him. He didn't make it. He passed away. And so especially for our young adult community, um, friends describing him as the nicest person you'll ever meet, like true Christ-like in character. He's 29 years old, a leader in the church, young family. His first child is not even one year old, and he's, he's gone. Um, even for the believer, there's grief. But grief is okay because there's hope at the end. We know we'll, we'll see our loved ones again. Um, I have not had a close family member die like that, so I don't know what grief is like on the intense side of the scale. I only know him as a friend and also just thinking of what his death means to our young adult community in the area. And um, being there, seeing the initial reactions and grief of everyone when we knew the news um, when it was announced. But um, I think from um, some of you may know who Mike Tucker is. He's an Adventist pastor who for a long time led the ministry of Life for Today, I think is what it's called. Um, his, his ministry partner was his wife, and for decades they were together, and his wife passed away. I think 2016, if I have the year right. So for him, as a pastor, you counsel people, and he would counsel people going through grief. And then he had his own turn, and he was writing about the different emotions and things that he was experiencing going through grief. Um, and kind of what I took away from that, not having personally experienced it myself to that degree, is that, one, grief is real, and it's okay to grieve. And I think some people going through grief, they wonder, how am I supposed to feel? Maybe how, what I'm feeling is wrong. Like, I'm not, I shouldn't feel this way. But I think that's the wrong line of thinking. Let grief play its course. Grieving is okay, and grieving is necessary as part of the, the healing process. But I think what it, it also teaches us is that we weren't designed for this. God designed us to live forever. And it's because of sin that we have the pain and the death and the brokenness in the here and now. So when, some, when somebody dies, like I was saying earlier, like not only is life mind-boggling to me, but death is mind-boggling to me. Because we, we weren't designed to have to go through that process. So when we see, when we're bonded to a friend or a loved one, and they pass away, that bond is broken. So although we have the guarantee of eternal life and reunion in the future, that emotional bond is broken, and that pain is not something we were designed to experience, and so it creates this turmoil within the soul. Um, but that's okay. If any of you have gone through grief, or you are going through grief, or it happens in the future, don't worry about what you're feeling. Let the grief come. In the end, we know that even though in death there may be sorrow, there is hope because in Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And so I look forward to seeing friends again um, and meeting my friend's children that I didn't have the opportunity to meet this time. So point number one, come to Christ. Point number two, seek help as needed to overcome. Point number three, no need to fear death because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And what's probably already been made clear at this point, point number four, life is precious. So treat those people that you meet in your life with love and compassion. Let's go to Matthew chapter 22, and this will be our last text for today. Uh, Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, starting in verse 36, the two great commandments. Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I think this is just a reality of a fallen, sinful nature. Humanity, by and large, does not treat their fellow brethren and si brothers and sisters with love and compassion. And just thinking about the current situation that we're grappling with in America, um, I, I don't want to misportray this, so please understand my point with this. Right now, racism has been set on a pedestal as the most evil of crimes that can be committed. Racism is horrible. And I appreciate Pastor Ray and his sermons in the past and where he's dealt with racial injustice, not only on a um, black to white relationship, but also him coming from the Hispanic viewpoint, he's able to show that it's really just a human condition, a sinful human condition that plagues all cultures to some degree. Um, racism is very evil. Um, however, there are other evils in society, and it saddens me that attention can be focused on one and not all. Um, for example, I mean, uh, trafficking or voluntary abortion or the rampant crime or even um, not just some of the tragedies by health, cancer and heart disease, for example, um, by lifestyle, these can be treated to a large extent. Um, although sin and brokenness can happen to anyone at any time. But just thinking about what the scriptures say about earth at the last times, it says the love of many will grow cold. And it's true. If, if you look out in the news or in, in society today, it seems by and large the love for human life is not what it should be. And so looking at this commandment of Jesus, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. He said that the way to show people that you are my disciples is to have love one for another. And so life is precious. Treat those that you meet, whether it's your family or your friends or acquaintances, with love and compassion. Whether it's people that come into our church building, uh, we should welcome them. Whether it's family or friends, as much as is in our control, I understand the need for boundaries, but as much as is in our control, to try to build quality relationships. Sometimes quality over quantity is a good thing. And view those with different circumstances to yours as being worthy of attention because Jesus has placed life in that person. Life is precious, so therefore each person is precious. How do we know the worth of a human soul? Its worth is determined by the value that somebody is willing to pay for it. And what has Jesus paid for the lives in the human family? He's given everything. He's given his life. Um, even in the scriptures, Jesus said that I have come to give my life a ransom for many. He's paid for our lives with the life of his own um, self. So, in summary, Jesus is life. In him is eternal life, this miraculous, incredible, mysterious, powerful life is in Jesus. So, number one, come to Christ. Stay connected to him. Number two, seek help to overcome struggles as needed. Number three, no need to be afraid of death because eternal life begins now. And number four, life is precious, so let's treat each other with love and compassion. How many of you today want to make a decision to say, I want to be connected to Jesus, the source of life, both in the now and in eternity? See your hands. Same for me as well. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much that you are the source of life and that by your love, really, that you have graciously extended life to all of us and that you sustain us and you sustain our world and you sustain our universe. I look forward to the day where there will be no more death and no more pain and no more suffering in our world, where we can have eternal life 
unbounded and in its full quality of richness. We have hope for the future. And I know that's, we're not there yet, but we know that you are with us today. I thank you so much for the abundant life that you've promised to us and just ask that day by day you help us to abide in you. Thank you so much for the gift of life. We give ourselves to you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.